Hi everyone, Jessica Morales joining you now with Mr. Tom Petrie, Chairman Petrie Partners. I also have my colleagues Steve Toon and Jennifer Presley joining us. Thanks for being with us guys. Good to be with you today. Tom, let's start off really, our discussion uh, is going to cover quite a bit, but let's just start off talking about the OPEC plus G20 agreement. Do you think it's too little too late to rescue oil prices in the near or medium term? Really, what are we looking at? How low can we go? Well, it, 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 it's easy to second guess it in terms of the timing, uh, but there's a big effort here. And it's quite a, quite a change from uh, anything they contemplated in previous meetings uh, going way, way back. So I think they get a lot of credit for that. And uh, uh, there were some challenges. It was almost upset. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see from here. Great. So what, you know, speaking of those challenges, Tom, you know, what's your take on Mexico's holdout, you know, to make those production cuts? I mean, is it, is it fairly rare that, um, or is it rare that a, that a single country can kind of stand out on its own and kind of request uh, special, you know, privileges like that? It, it is unusual, uh, not totally unprecedented. If you go way back a couple decades ago, there were, there were other instances that were roughly analogous to what we saw here. Uh, the unusual thing was, was that uh, President Trump uh, managed to uh, call the president and and get him to uh, uh, come back with enough of a, a modification. The request to him was for 250,000 barrel a day of cut, and he came back and agreed to do 100,000. And it was very unusual that the president of the United States would prevail, but he was probably the right person to make that call at that time. Hey, Tom. Um you know, the previous production cuts didn't end until the end of March. Uh, so, so we've only been in this a couple of weeks or so. Um, on the supply side, is, is this mostly saber rattling at this, at this point? Or have Saudi and Russia and others put real barrels into the market that's going to have uh, the deep impact that everybody's fearing right now? Well, here's how I look at it, Steve. I, I think nobody expected the kind of schism to develop that developed between MBS, the, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, and, and Vladimir Putin. Um, and uh, I think it's fair to say that, that Putin decided he didn't want to participate in what was first proposed. And, um, and he thought, you know, oil at that time was uh, somewhere around the low 40s. And I think he was thinking, well, this will take it down into the middle 30s, maybe, or something like that. And that may be good because it'll actually have an impact on U.S. shale development. Uh, I think both, M and then MBS had his reaction, which was, well, if you're going to go for market share, we'll go for market share. When they made that, when that became public in a very uh, uh, short-term way, very quick way, um, I think both of those leaders were shocked to find that they had succeeded in breaking the $20 per barrel mark. And I think that's what, that became the catalyst for a serious effort that we now have. So I do think it's a reasonably serious effort, but like times back in the 80s, we're gonna to have to have some time to judge whether the weaker players in OPEC can really deliver on the parts that are expected of them and how much will they say one thing and do another. So to some degree, this is back to the future um, with uh, some of the things that we used to have to look at back in the 1980s. Okay, just as a follow-up quickly though, the, the price plummeted on the threat of all this, but you know, I'm just wondering, have, have real barrels gone into the market? Is, is the market really being flooded or is it just the fear of it being flooded at this point, Tom? No, I think it's fair to say that, that it, it is flooded by virtue of the lack of demand. Uh, you know, you even if production is down, that there's when when I started looking at this a month and a half ago, I thought, gee, we've got an eight to ten million barrel a day uh, demand problem. Pretty soon, I began to realize a week or ten days later, no, this is twice that. Then I began to talk to people in the industry who said, you know, we're not flying the airplanes or or we're flying them empty uh, in order to carry uh, freight, but not with people on them and we're not flying them on the same schedules we had. Uh, we're not driving, people are staying at home as, as more and more enforcement 
of the quarantines came along. And so it really is probably a, in the very short term, at least, a 30 to 35 million barrel a day drop in demand. Now it's, is, it's artificially induced in, by virtue of uh, the extreme measures to quarantine people. Uh, but it's real in, this, in terms of an oversupply because the wells haven't stopped pumping, uh, or at least they haven't stopped pumping nearly enough to rebalance things. Uh, so, that'll change, but right now that's the problem. So do you see operators being forced to shut in wells? And, and if so, will it be because of the economics, physical constraints, or, or just the government mandates? Uh, good question. I think uh, it, in the month of April, the balance of this month going into May, uh, we're going to be at a point that, that storage is virtually full. Access to storage is going to be limited to those who control long-term transportation. And so, uh, you know, I do think it's going to be a very difficult uh, month or two months while we're dealing with those realities. And then when we start to reopen, it begins to heal itself. So on storage, Tom, um, okay, we've got OPEC plus G20 nations, a lot more than OPEC plus, uh, that are agreeing to, to cut. Is this a so-called flattening the curve toward the bottom for uh, the overfill? Or you know, are we really approaching maximum storage capacity? And if so, how low can oil prices go if that happens? Yeah, well, creativity often comes in on this storage issue. And um, I don't think we've stored it as much oil on, on ships that aren't going to carry it anywhere as we still could. The SPR, uh, as of a few days ago, uh, still had 300 million barrels of capacity. Um, but normally, in the way the SPR worked, the government would buy the oil and put it in. Uh, I think it's going to, uh, the, the, the way to use that most efficiently would be to offer that as, as uh, for a fee for somebody who has production, they could put it into the SPR and pay some kind of a nominal uh, storage fee, and that would help alleviate the problem. So, yes. how, you know, you're saying, you're saying we won't reach maximum capacity. Is that what I'm interpreting? We're getting close. So yeah. the oil price, I mean, I just... What, we're close to 20 today, Tom? What's, you know, is there more downside? Uh, well, we're, we're under 20 as, uh, on the screen. And when you really look at basis blowout, which we've also had, Steve, uh, because the, the problem the independent producer has is right now, uh, when if they want a real market, somebody who either has control of storage themselves, a refiner that has control of storage, or... Um, uh, or somebody who wants to actually turn it into product and will take the risk of not being able to sell that product. They're saying, okay, the nominal price is $19.60, just to pick a number that's typical of this morning on the screen. And they'll say, and if you really want to sell this, I'll pay you $14 or $15. You know, it's, it's a classic basis blowout proposition. Yeah, so there's certainly we have the known storage you know, be it vessels, SPR, um, pipelines, et cetera. But, you know, is there a, an unknown or what is the unknown impact, if you will, of the the ducks that are out there? You know, that's essentially storage. Um, it just hasn't been produced yet. So it's all kind of sitting in Mother Nature's storage like it has been for millions of years. You know, what kind of overhang do we have there that we need to factor into, you know, the, the rest of the, the discussion? Well, here, here's how I look at the ducks. It's really a good, good question because part of the problem is uh, we went from 10 and a half million barrels a day to 12 and a half very quickly. And that, that caused some of the uh, forecasting people, EIA and so on, to say, well, gee, if we can go from 10 and a half to 12 and a half as uh, expeditiously as we did, there's no reason we can't get to 13, which is some people, where we, some people think we are today, uh, 13, 13. 0.5, 14 million barrels a day. Uh, but I, I would take a little different take. I think the ducks that um, have been harvested are the best ducks. People who drill ducks actually know the, uh, the attributes of the reservoir. They drill the best ones. There may be some A minus ones, some B plus, and some B minus yet to do. Uh, and that will have some bearing, uh, whether those get harvested and when they get harvested will be a function of where we settle out on price. 
Um, right now, we have had the fastest laydown in drilling rigs in American history. Uh, the laydown that we had of rigs uh, after the Thanksgiving surprise was pretty rapid, but this one, but it took a six to eight month period. In this case, it took six to eight weeks. Um, and, and so uh, it's real compressed. And so uh, the harvesting of the ducks with a rig laid on that we've had uh, is, is, is a deferred problem, if you will, or a deferred opportunity, depending on what the price of oil ends up being. But the, the thing that really happened is once oil broke, nine, broke 20, um, I, I think both Saudi Arabia and Russia said, we've, over re we've caused an overreaction in the market. And by the way, we have some things we want to do with our oil, and we sure don't want to sell it at anything that's tied to that kind of a price. So, uh, so that's why I think they're serious about it. I do think there'll be some genuine enforcement. The uh, oil minister of Saudi Arabia spoke this morning, and he reiterated what President Trump had said. The official announcement said 9.7 million barrels a day of cuts from OPEC and OPEC plus, that being Russia. Uh, the, now what we have is a situation where they, they were also talking about what else can we get in the world. And, and, you know, they actually came to the U.S. and said, what can you do? And the U.S. obviously has policy and political issues uh, not to be uh, a party to working with a cartel on an official basis. However, um, the U.S. was quick to say, the EIA has had a wake up call and they no longer think 13 becomes 14 million barrels a day. They actually think 13 uh, by the end of this year may well test close to 11 million barrels a day, i.e. down 2 million barrels a day. Won't happen overnight, but it will happen in their view by, by calendar fourth quarter. And so, so the U.S., you know, the U.S. is not, not cooperatively operating with OPEC, but the economic reality, when $50 oil became $20 minus oil, uh, that really uh, provided something that they had to uh, uh, really uh, think about in a different way. And so I think the self-correcting forces have been triggered for American shale. Uh, and, and we can think in terms of, in the course of this year, uh, the US uh, contributing uh, minus two million barrels a day. The rest of it, the rest of the world, if we get decent compliance, and I would define that as 85 to 90 percent of the 20 million barrels, you then you get to a total of 20, counting the U.S. and then and and the others who have made pledges. Yeah, so we've certainly we've talked about the shale side of the of the the picture here. I'm just curious, what's your take on um, offshore? And what does that mean for the Gulf of Mexico and, and other offshore regions, the, these, uh, you know, what, what's happened? Well, uh, you know, the, there's an embedded decline, about 40%, uh, an, an optimistic estimate of, of the role of shale would say on the margin, it's been 40% of the growth we've had. 60% has been from uh, offshore and other traditional sources of development. Um, and I think quite clearly we've had big cuts in capital spending by the private sector around the world. And, and so I think projects will be deferred where they can be. Um, hookups will, will, uh, will occur uh, on a more extended calendar. And, um, and I think, you know, I think the rebalancing elsewhere in the world will be there and, and therefore we'll also get a better measure of what I call the embedded decline in conventional oil. And the estimates have, have varied, but they, I'd say a, a good conservative estimate of the embedded decline in the, in the conventional oil around the world is somewhere between three and a half and four million barrels a day. And so that, that will be kicking in as well. Um, and offshore will be in for its share of that, as will others. Uh, but it will cause uh, companies to decide how much the, of their future capital in the next certainly year or two or three uh, they want to allocate to new developments. So, Tom, you've uh, you, you've talked about the supply side and the and the cuts and uh, and that. But the the crux of the problem right now. 
uh, albeit the OPEC, saw, uh, the OPEC and Russia kerfuffle came at bad timing, but demand is at the forefront of all of this right now, the destruction in demand. Um, I'm not going to ask you to predict coronavirus with any accuracy, but what time frame do you think we're looking at before demand uh, numbers start returning to normal, or will they return to normal? Uh, I think we are definitely talking about a new kind of normal. It won't be the old normal. It will be a, a redefined normal. Uh, and um, uh, but I but we're also the reason you've heard the president of the United States talk about not having the cure be worse than the than the the virus itself. Uh, and the reason he's come up with this advisory group about reopening is he, he, he realizes what the problem is. He's met with a lot of the industry leaders here recently in the White House. It's been very public. Um, and they're explaining to him about this 30 to 35 million barrel a day decrement that's a function of quarantine. So that's why every afternoon when he's doing these briefings, uh, he is weighing in on we need to be, uh, when we get the flattening that uh, the experts on the coronavirus are br briefing him on, when we get that flattening and, uh, and think we're, we're past the peak, uh, there's a judgment call required uh, as to how you open up, how quickly you do and so on. So the first uh, definition of the new normal, I think will be an extended open up. Uh, he talked yesterday about 20 and then ultimately 29 states out of the 50 that have had relatively low incidence of the virus. They're, they're obviously states that are not as, uh, uh, not as dense. You know, the, the poster child could be Wyoming. The first death in Wyoming only occurred a few days ago from the virus and the incident of infection is very low. Uh, Montana is another one. Uh, so I think you're going to see that across that spectrum of 20 to 29 states, some kind of an opening up trying to occur. Now that's, that's still, you know, those are typically because they're not the dense states. It's not the big part of the economy, but I think it's the safe thing that they think they can do. And then it'll be a question, uh, have you bought time while you're opening those states up? Have you bought time for the big states that are the big part of the economy uh, to get, uh, better control of the situation. And the news on that coming out of New York is, is somewhat encouraging in that it seems like the chaos of uh, the early days of dealing with the hospitalization burden uh, is easy. And so, you know, give it another uh, four weeks or six weeks or something like that uh, with a phase opening that I think, you know, his, uh, President Trump's comment yesterday was, some of this might happen before the 1st of May. And my guess is the advisory group's gonna tell him, you know, do something relative to what you said so you signal that it's coming, but don't do it so aggressively that you incur the risk of what happened in Singapore where uh, they, they started getting back to quote, the old normal was thinking. And, uh, and all of a sudden uh, the rate of infection picked right up again with the virus. So Tom, that's, if, that's the issue. Tom, if I can jump in, uh, we have about five minutes left. Can I get your take on the Texas Railroad Commission meeting yesterday? I mean, you mentioned the fastest laydown of rigs in American history. You know, no doubt a lot of the players and operators concerned. What's your take on them meeting yesterday? Uh, well, I've looked over a number of the filings that were made and uh, it was interesting because it was not unanimous. The industry, uh, the industry has, People who, some people who are saying, look, this is not waste. Uh, the normal authorizing authority for uh, the Texas Railroad Commission is their ability to control production uh, uh, to avoid waste. Um, and that came out of the, uh, some of the excesses, you know, uh, back in the 1930s with the East Texas field. Um, th this one, uh, this is this is a broader, maybe more sophisticated definition of waste, where uh, the idea of developing new production uh, or bringing on additional production at a time that uh, what's already been drilled is is being uh, uh, exploited at less than an economic rate of return. Um, and I would say my my sense is 
there was there was general support for that, but there were some that were quite uh, quite uh, clear that they opposed the railroad commission doing too much. I don't know what their final decision is going to be. My hunch is uh, the easy decision or the easier decision will be to say we acknowledge that there's a big impact here, um, uh, but we think the we think the markets are working in that. Uh, uh, the the lay down of rigs, to, which are really really severe now, uh, mm -hmm. are such that it's not up to us to make a big call here, uh, but we encourage individual operators to recognize the economic reality, something along those lines. But there may be more than that. There may be support enough support where they actually come out with guidance or something like that, that doesn't have quite the force of law that we saw back in the 1930s. I know you mentioned, of course, we can't predict the future. You know, Steve was saying can't predict coronavirus. It's been a double, triple threat, if you will, double whammy to the industry. Uh, how long do you think, if you can tell the future, will this realistically be felt? Some businesses are saying they won't feel back to normal for a year and a half. They may be businesses outside the energy industry, but there's a lot to think about. There really is. Uh, we don't know what we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether this, uh, whether, uh, well, number one, we don't have a, vi we don't have a vaccine yet. And right. the experts tell us we won't have one until uh, the fall of next year at the earliest. Um, uh, number two, there are those who say that this, this thing could become like the flu. It could be an annual event. Uh, we're going to be a lot better equipped to deal with it if it comes back next year. Uh, and those infected, we don't know for sure whether those infected can be reinfected. Uh, that's a big unknown. So it's, it's going to be tough. This is, this is transformational. And then I was listening today uh, when people were talking about how do the airlines adapt? And they're saying it may well be that when you arrive at the airport, you'll be given a mask. When you get on the airplane, they, they're already, two, two of the airlines, Delta and one other, American, I think, where uh, uh, for the few people that are flying, they don't put anybody in the middle seat. Now that doesn't get you the full six week, six uh, feet of separation, but it's better. And that with a mask and so on. So there's a whole bunch of adaptation. When I go to the bank to deposit a check right now, I'm only allowed in along with a couple of other people at, the, at this particular bank. Mm -hmm. I have my mask on, they have a screen in front of them. I think. Some of those near-term adaptations, I don't think they're going away. I think that's part of the, how we're gonna change. And then ultimately, um, given the, the blame that's being placed on China for this, and, and with some basis for that, obviously, um, uh, the rate of global economic growth is, has a chance of being affected, not just this year, but uh, this decade. Um, and and that, that's, a, that's a sobering thought. That is a perfect way to describe it, I think. A very sobering thought there. I really appreciate you taking the time with us, Tom, and Jennifer and Steve. We appreciate the discussion and know there will be many more discussions to come. I think that's the case. But uh, hopefully we've opened a, oh, It's made me think some more, so thank you for good questions. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it, Tom. For more hard energy videos, follow our social media channels.